As we get closer to 2050 and recognize the impacts from climate change that communities across the globe are facing today, reaching net zero is critically important. The United States has relied on fossil fuels and this has resulted in greenhouse gas emissions, but also contributes to health impacts. And of course, our most vulnerable communities, communities of color, lower wealth white communities, and indigenous populations are the ones who are hit first and worst. We need to move in a very smart and thoughtful way. And especially for some of these communities that are going to see significant changes in their local economy as a result of these transitions. If we're talking about net zero, we need to ensure that we're talking about approaching it in a way that is equitable and just, then there cannot be winners and losers in this equation. We've got to make sure there's truly a just transition. That just transition means that no one gets left behind. This call for you know, net zero is really important, but it has to be such that everybody is a part of this solution. With climate change, we're already starting to see the impacts firsthand. Extreme weather events, higher temperatures, flooding, coastal erosion, sea level rise. These impacts tend to be the same across different communities but the level of exposure and degree of severity tend to differ for different communities. Generally, those left behind are communities of color and underserved communities. Communities that typically don't have accessibility to affordable housing and to affordable education and healthcare. These areas traditionally are the last to receive resources and also the first to have, you know, at times, irrecoverable impact. We're talking about communities that have an older housing stock, who are living in spaces that are energy inefficient. And when you bring climate change, you know, into it, we've got to look at what the root causes of climate change um, are. We look at, you know, things like a very extractive economy. These communities are vulnerable to, you know, air pollution and to the health impacts that that causes. We definitely see that in the South and Southeast, but you know, also in, in other places in the Appalachian regions as well. People have been suffering from the pollution, asthma, they're dealing with lung issues such as lung cancer and other lung diseases um, because of the pollution. These are the various types of dynamics that we've created across our country and now we have the overlay of the climate crisis, which brings a number of other additional dynamics into the space. You can stick your hand in a hat and you can pull out any array of issues from flooding, for example, not having water infrastructure in place that leads to issues such as sewage contamination. There are certain areas that have been so overwhelmed by heat that they are not able to grow food. That's a direct correlation between climate change and access to food and access to a quality of life. How do we get to this type of situation in our country, the wealthiest country in the world? One of the key factors can be attributed to our historical redlining and racial segregation laws that were in place starting in the 1930s. The government actually created maps delineating areas that they considered higher risk. And those higher risk areas essentially corresponded to communities with more minorities and more immigrant populations. So we had laws on the books that actually pushed African Americans and a number of other groups into flood zones. They were pushed into areas of swamps and the least desirable lands. And that created a set of situations where there was disinvestment. These policies have shaped, you know, where industries tend to locate. And so while many of those policies that have shaped, you know, some of that planning in our country no longer exist, there is still an indelible imprint that has been left because of those policies. And these communities, if we don't begin to make real change happen, if we don't begin to lower the emissions and hopefully one day be able to eliminate the emissions, 
they are going to continue to not only be in the sacrifice zones, but they're gonna be the sacrifice people based upon the policy decisions that we've made. So it makes sense for us to address the climate crisis because when we make these investments now, we are strengthening these communities that have often been sacrificed. We're in a time where we're asking ourselves critical questions. What do we want the future to look like? What do we want energy to look like? What do we want prosperity to look like? So we're really right now concentrating on switching from coal-fired generation for our electricity to natural gas, solar, and wind mostly. As we go forward with the energy transition, we have to make sure that we are not leaving behind the workers who have powered our system for decades. Many of the coal towns where coal is mined are in rural areas. Some are also in urban areas, but many are in rural areas, especially the coal mining towns and some of them are built around coal. They will have to diversify their economies. There's really not a job in some of those communities to go to, so they will have to plan for a different future. So we have to figure out a way really quickly to make this economically make sense for the communities that need it most. We also have to make sure that we consider our aging populations that are not retiring yet. We've got to bring everybody to the table. And I think the, ch the challenge is showing people where they fit in this conversation so they don't feel left behind. We need to make sure that we are targeting opportunities towards these communities to make sure, again, that they are brought in as part of the solution. This can include, you know, not just helping them become resilient to the current impacts that they're facing and we are all facing, but also making sure that we're providing adequate job training opportunities for this new economy, certification, and other programs that will help them have a leg up as these economies and industries continue to grow. So we start to begin to do those basic sets of actions, then it gives people a stronger foundation underneath of them helps them to understand the various sets of opportunities that we have in front of us. Uh, and then for some opportunities, especially on the entrepreneurial side, we can make sure that there's some, some seed money that's there for folks to be able to get those businesses up off the ground that they might be considering starting or expanding. It's about education. It's about access to capital. It's about access to resources. Underserved populations don't have access to discretionary income. They can barely you know, afford their, their paycheck to paycheck. There's a lot of investments being made to electrify our grid, to move to more electric vehicles and electric bikes. And we need to make sure that those are accessible to all of us, not just the high income communities that are able to afford solar panels on their roof. Before we, you know, can even talk about solar, for some households, especially for people who live in older housing stock, especially, you know, that housing stock that might be found in many communities of color and lower income communities. We have to look at, you know, ways to make that housing stock more energy efficient to begin with. So, you know, pro programs like, um, programs that focus on things like weatherization. There's so many things to think about like that. And I think um, we need to start by listening. We can't just put up a sign and say, you know, let us know what you think about this new energy plan. We have to go into these communities and spend time there and we have to establish trust. That's really, it takes a long time, it's hard, but it's really important. We cannot assume going into a community we know, we know what they want. We have to go into conversations, listening to understand and not just to respond, right? Because too often when you go in to respond, you're talking over the people that live every day in the areas that we get to leave and go back to the comfort of our homes and our offices. People move at the speed of trust, and you know, the speed of trust is slow because they don't know if you're really coming in to do what you say you're going to do, or is this going to be another situation where you're extracting and not putting back. So we're all walking in with a little bit of distrust and a lot of angst, and I believe we need to plan for that, and that means time. We just have to do that kind of work. And so we need to be in those communities a lot earlier, and, and, and I think be a little bit honest about the fact that we haven't been in them before. You know, when Energy 1.0 was built, these were entrepreneurs. They were mavericks, but they were men. Where were the women 100 years ago? Well, they were in the home. And people of color didn't have the right to vote, and they didn't have access to credit. Women didn't have access to resources. So when we built 
Energy 1.0, we were not in a place where society was ready to bring everybody to the table. But I think we know that an equitable, affordable energy transition is gonna be the solution. And that means bringing multiple voices, multiple faces. It means not just relying on current people that are in the industry. And so I get excited because Energy 2.0, it's an opportunity for everybody to be at the table. We've got to seek out new ideas, but that means we've got to engage. That means we have to talk about it. That means we have to have tough conversations about what it's really going to take to bring the transition forward. And if we're not um, intentional about making sure that every community is brought along, we could potentially get close to net zero, but still have things out of balance in terms of certain communities bearing this disproportionate burden. And that cannot happen. We are arguably the first generation that can eradicate poverty and the last generation that can end the climate crisis. So we have to think of the climate crisis as our most urgent matter, as a priority that cannot be compromised at all, or we're gonna end up fumbling on both poverty and climate. And I believe that if we do the right thing now, the climate crisis can not only be addressed, but we can put ourselves on track to resolve many of these issues that I think have crippled um, not just our country, but the planet as a whole. So now the question is, how do we get it done? The reality of the situation is that it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take Democrats, Republicans, independents, everyone coming together to be able to navigate what's, uh, you know, the climate crisis that we're dealing with, but we have to think in a much broader construct. It is not just about dealing with the climate crisis. It is also about how do we build a new economy, a new set of opportunities, and will the United States actually be the leader in that space? We've done it before. If you go back and look through the Industrial Revolution, we were a leader in so many different sets of opportunities. We once again have that, that chance. I'm optimistic that it's gonna happen, but it's gonna take work and it's gonna take each and every one of us leaning in in our respective ways.